My name is Charlie Ewing um, and I am indeed IT Director here at the Met Office. So, um, firstly welcome. Uh, anybody not been here before or are you all seasoned visitors? Oh, quite a few. I wish I'd known that because we could have done a, a little bit of a tour. Um, unfortunately it won't be for this time but should we come back, which I'm sure we will, then we'll, we'll arrange that for you next time. Um, so the Met Office, uh, this building was built in 2002, I believe, um, when the Met Office moved down lock, stock and barrel from Bracknell up near Reading. Uh, the purpose, the reason for that was that they'd outgrown their surroundings, uh, needed somewhere else and in the, in the fine days of uh, rural development um, funds and those kinds of things, Exeter put in a very compelling bid and hence the Met Office decided to move lock, stock and barrel to Exeter. So um, we do like to say that we're a global organisation with 56 sites which is very true. Uh, however, this is by far and away the dominant site. So out of just something just over 2,000 employees, about 1,800 of them are based here, uh, here at Exeter. And indeed, uh, right now, sorry, here, speak to this. Not loud enough? Oh, my word. Um, okay, I'll shout then, because I won't be able to stand there close to that. So, um, yeah, about 1,800 employees based here. And uh, today, nearly all of the ITs here as well. We do have some other facilities, notably quite a large one in Aberdeen, but, but all the supercomputer and, and most of the infrastructure is based here at Exeter. So what I intend to do is go through a little bit of a history lesson, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of uh, explanation about how weather forecasts are done, and then try and get a bit more contemporary and explain who the Met Office are and what we do with a focus on computing today. So first prize for 10, nobody from the Met Office is allowed to answer. Does anybody recognize that person? I know there's one at the back, but you can't say who it is. Good, good effort. What about now? Darwin, right. So Darwin's very important in the history of the Met Office, uh, in so much that this chap, who you probably won't know, uh, who's a guy called Fitzroy. Um, everybody knows about Darwin, nobody knows about Fitzroy in the main, unless you happen to work at the Met Office. So uh, Darwin's second Beagle voyage in 18... Make sure I get this right, especially as it's on video. Um, which was uh, 1831 to 1836. So this is the, uh, this is the voyage upon which uh, Darwin created his first kind of hypotheses and postulations about the origin of species through natural selection. And everybody knows that. Everybody knows it was Beagle 2 voyage. Nobody knows that Fitzroy was the captain. And it was actually a hydrographic mission and nothing at all to do with, uh, with botany, biology, or, 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 or evolution. Um, he was there as a companion to Fitzroy um, because I think the guy was called Stokes, uh, the captain of Beagle 1, committed suicide through loneliness. Uh, somewhat ironically, so did uh, ultimately. Um, so, did, uh, so did Fitzroy. Um, however, he was purely there as a companion and was recommended as a companion by, oh, that's the voyage, um, just in case you didn't know, by this chap who was a guy called Beaufort, who was a contemporary of both Darwin and Fitzroy uh, in the sort of uh, 1800s. And we all know Beaufort these days for um, the Beaufort scales of various sorts. Now, this is quite important because it demonstrates just how long ago structure and data, structured data, was important to weather forecasts. And also indicates um, how, for a very long time, weather forecasting is intrinsically a global business, for reasons that I'll explain in a minute. And the interoperability and interchange of information is an intrinsic part of it. So a lot of these themes have become trendy, so we know about open data these days, and we're all advocates, of course, uh, and the ability to uh, make sure that other people can reuse data and information. This, this domain has been doing it for a very, very long time. Um, the other interesting thing about the Beaufort scale is, uh, is an interoperability uh, uh, observation in so much that he cleverly found physical observations that were consistent, persistent, and ubiquitous. So the fact that the fact that um, leaves are in motion um, at whatever that is, no, uh, code number three, uh, obviously that's going to be the same wherever you are in the world. So it means that you've got some empirical method to make sure that your observation of a certain wind speed is going to be the same regardless of where you are. So quite an interesting and clever way to look at the world. Um, and weather reports, you'll recognise this as, as technology-based people as, you know, structured data observation. The fact that it didn't know, didn't make any use of computing or computers was merely because they didn't exist. Uh, it wasn't because it wasn't already a very, a very structured and analytical process. So, um, weather forecasts. Uh, this is one of the first ones in the, in the late 1800s, 1873, this one. Uh, and some of the, 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 they've been published in pretty much a recognisable form for as long as that. So uh, not much has changed in the, in the way that we present them. Uh, and this is one of the first uh, computational devices, I suppose, uh, that you could put it, that was used in the process of weather forecasting. And again, I'm going to refer to my notes because I don't want to get the name of the thing wrong. Um, this is a Kelvin harmonic analyzer. 
uh, and it's, a, it's just a computational machine uh, that was used in 1878, used for a number of years actually, decommissioned in 1890, um, and it was used to calculate tidal, uh, 10 tidal con constituents. I've absolutely no idea what that means. Uh, I don't know if anybody else in the room does, but it's, it's purely an example of the fact that uh, computational devices have been used and adopted very, very early in their lifetimes in our domain for, for, for a very long period. So moving quickly on into the kind of numerical weather prediction. So these days, um, weather forecasting is a numerical business and makes great use of computers and, and computational uh, techniques. So some of you may be old enough to recognize, I think I, I am actually, what this is. This is a Hollerith machine, which is the machine that was used to punch cards. And so um, back again, before, before numerical weather prediction really got off, this is a picture from Bracknell, you know, I would guess looking at it in late 60s perhaps. Uh, is, it, is there a picture of it? No, there isn't. Um, but this is in Bracknell of Hollerith machines being used around observations. We have an expert in observations sat at the back of the room. Uh, she'll be delighted to answer any difficult questions. Uh, and this is a punch card. Those of you that are old enough of my vintage anyway may remember when you used to do your computing, you would send your punch cards away to the, away to the university to be processed. This is an example of such sort of card. Uh, this is actually a Dutch one, I think. Uh, can anybody read? Is it Dutch? Yeah, so it's an observation card. Um, but this is the way in which the observations were shared beyond the sharing of paper records. We started to share these Dutch cards. Um, some kind of interesting statistics here. By 1939, still using uh, um, um, punch cards, two and a half million observations had been punched and recorded. Uh, and these were, these were shared widely uh, around the meteorological domain uh, in order that we could build a picture of, of the world's atmosphere for important reasons that we'll, um, that we'll go on to. So, uh, yeah, oh, there we are. Yeah, so some, some, some interesting kind of uh, dates and, and things on punch cards. 180 tonnes worth accumulated by 1971, you might notice there at the bottom. Um, so an important thing to share observations, a few more sort of laughable pictures. This is the teleprinter room. So again, another method that was used to exchange, uh, exchange observations and information around international match services were teleprinters when they, when, they, uh, when they were invented. And they were very widely used, I'm told, for about 10 or 15 years as a kind of manual way to share observation. But the world started to change uh, with this guy, another prize for 10. Uh, anybody recognize this chap? I'm going to get this wrong, but this is, this is a guy called Birkness. I believe, a Norwegian, uh, and he was around uh, from uh, 1862 to 1951, and uh, as a Nor the Norwegians were actually the first to move to describe the mathematics associated with the atmosphere. Um, so the primitive equations of meteorology as they're known, and they're still pretty fundamental to weather forecasting. So the, the world's atmosphere obviously is a physical system. Uh, we're quite lucky. We model and predict the weather, which is a physical system which is driven by the laws of physics. Now, some people are onto a real loser. Uh, I did a lecture recently at the uh, Bank of England, for example, where they're trying to model economics. Now economics are, you know, they're onto a loser from the start. Firstly, that world doesn't subscribe to any particular rules. Um, secondly, any predictions that they make will affect the outcome. So we can say what we like about the weather, and regardless of what the Daily Express might think, actually it doesn't make a jot of difference what happens to the weather. The weather will happen regardless of how we've predicted it. Whereas in economic terms, of course, when you try and predict the, uh, the economy, then you intrinsically change the state of that system. So, so our job, if you like, uh, at its most basic level, is describable purely through mathematics, not magic and, 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 uh, and, and social factors, which is, is quite an advantage for us. Um, so moving on, this guy is, is very famous and indeed for a time was a Met Office employee, Louis Fry Richardson, who was 1881 to 1953, um, was the first person to actually attempt a numerical weather prediction. So this is nothing to do with seaweed, nothing to do with red skies at night or, or those kinds of things. This is an attempt, the first attempt really, to use those seven fundamental sets of equations and apply them to observations to see if there was any uh, ability to predict the atmosphere. And he thought about it, as many people do, conceptually, initially, and he said, imagine a, imagine a hemisphere full of tiered rows, for any of you that have been to the Royal Albert Hall, imagine that kind of thing, but fully circular, with lots of tiers, and imagine all those people doing arithmetic calculations. How many people would I need to fill that, that theatre, and what kinds of sums would they need to do to pass on 
to the next person in the chain to be able to predict the state of the atmosphere? And the answer he came up with was 64,000 calculators. So he said, he thought, that if you had a room full of 64,000 people and they all applied the, the, the relevant mathematics um, of, of hot air rising, of pressure moving from high to low, and pass that sum on to the next person for the next part of the, part of the atmosphere, they would be able to take that input and describe the output, and thus he'd be able to build a computational machine. Um, he was wrong on a couple of layers. Uh, when he actually tried to do this, which he did do later on, and I'll, I'll come on to that, uh, it came to prove that you actually need to double up those numbers um, to be able to uh, do the sums required. There were some factors, gravity waves being one of them. So effectively, his method that he described mathematically was never going to work. You were never going to be able to identify the signal and the noise. But uh, nonetheless, conceptually, oh, what's this? Conceptually, uh, he was quite correct. So what do we do, actually, to forecast the atmosphere? Well, as I've already said, it's a physical system. So like for any physical system that you want to predict the future of, uh, then you have to capture its, steady st its current state. So one of the really important and uh, 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 um, dominant functions here at, the, here at the Met Office is an observations system. Uh, and that's space-based, marine-based, atmosphere-based and land-based um, observations, which really are just about measuring the as-is. And that's absolutely a global business. Weather forecasting is a global business, as you can imagine. You can't forecast the weather for the UK because our weather comes just for the UK and do it just for the UK because you have no idea what's coming across the Atlantic, as Michael Fish found out in 1987. Um, so you have to have visibility of what's going on in the world weather patterns before you can describe what's going to happen over the UK. Um, so our observations system, uh, and I've, I've raced through the kind of history of it, but for a very long time, certainly exceeding 150 years, has been very, very collaborative. So the UK uh, operate within a number of structures, which I'm not going to go into uh, in, in this talk, um, but we could, both structured and unstructured uh, collaborations with a heap of agencies, but most notably with other National Met Services and institutions, of which there are 191, I think, uh, which are all organized, uh, some might say herded like cats, by a United Nations organization called the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization. And their job primarily is to define the purpose and the, st excuse me, and the standards and methods to meet that purpose. So they don't tell us how to do our job, but what they do do is effectively they're a standards agency, and they've been there for a very very long time uh, and the standards are proven to work uh, and they allow us to exchange observations freely across geopolitical boundaries uh, in time of peace and war so there's hardly any things you can point to or times you can point at whereby these observations haven't uh, haven't freely been exchanged across boundaries and to give you an idea of the scale of that that's probably about half the work and cost of the whole of the Met Office is purely in establishing an understanding of the current state of the atmosphere. Um, that's uh, something like, and I've got to be careful with experts in the room, usually I don't do these things with anybody that knows what, that knows what I'm going to say. Uh, we process about 100 million observations a day uh, in terms of consumption, and we deal with about 400 million observations a day uh, uh, from in a variety of shapes and sizes, all largely expressed for those of you in database paradigms, in, typically in a document paradigm. And the reason that we use a document paradigm as opposed to a, uh, any, any other way of looking at the world is because clearly it wasn't that long ago they really were documents. So that kind of old age document paradigm has translated into the way that we think of databases. And we call these things bulletins. And uh, it's an interesting, uh, seemingly quite archaic, but actually quite up to date uh, way to do things. So we combine that with the fundamental equations that I expressed earlier and up there there's a picture of uh, just about zero on the, on the right hand side of uh, Professor Dame Julia Slingo, our current chief scientist. Um, she's a physicist as many that work at the Met Office are, mathematicians and physicists, we've got lots of those. Um, and the science program constantly develops its understanding of those fundamental mathematics and indeed, when you look into the longer temporal timescales, a lot of this is chemistry. So chemical exchanges uh, have, a lot, have a lot to do with how the atmosphere responds in a longer time, mostly physics, near term, mostly maths. So it gets more complex as you, as you go out in time. So the science program, of which here, there are probably about 600 people that would describe themselves as scientists, and their job is to constantly further the understanding of the workings of the atmosphere, such that they can ultimately embed it in a huge, great code or a set of codes. So the set of codes uh, we call the unified model. The unified model is in itself a misnomer. It's actually a collection of models that are bolted together by some extremely clever uh, engineers and scientists in such a way that we can feed in those observations, simplistically turn the handle on the supercomputer and start to predict uh, the, the uh, work of the atmosphere. Now in reality, for obvious reasons, I'm underplaying the complexity of that to a, to a huge extent. Uh, one, of the, one of the big challenges um, 
but, but conceptually that is it. One of the big challenges is assimilation, so the ability to take those observations from various places, various times, various degrees of calibration, and build that picture of the atmosphere that computationally is biased correctly. So we trust this particular observation that was taken 10 minutes ago a little bit less than we might take this particular, this other sort of observation that's more calibrated that we've taken uh, more recently. Uh, and there's an awful lot of mathematics involved in that, as there is indeed in initializing the predictive models themselves. They, in a counterintuitive way, use some of their output to actually stabilize their input. So we use previous models as part of that initialization regime. And for those of you that are interested, this is described on the website in a thing called 4 var, which is our current assimilation schema. Hugely complex mathematics and works certainly well beyond me. Um, and by turning the handle of the supercomputer, ultimately we can produce predictions and simulations of, of, of what's going to happen. Now, this isn't a political point, but I'm going to make it anyway. Um, the Met Office do that, and the Met Office uh, now stand with about seven or eight other agencies of global scale that do this. So there's 191 National Met Services, only seven or eight do that full end-to-end -end global simulation. Um, and that's what you'd call a simulation. So other people refer to them as models uh, or raw data. Um, and there's only about seven agencies that do that, and the Met Office is one of them. And in terms of ranking, if you like, independently ranked to certainly be in the world's top two in terms of accuracy in doing that piece of work. Now, there's a whole plethora of organizations that take those model outputs and create weather forecasts. Some of them are great, and some of them are awful. Uh, and I'm not going to go into who I think is great and who I think is awful. Met Office do that as well. So it's really important, you know, as you look at a weather forecast on an app or on a telly, to recognize that underneath that forecast, somebody will have provided a model. Some of these model outputs are free, uh, but typically the ones that are free uh, are um, of quite low resolution. And so therefore, when they're interpolated for a, for, for a postcode place-based forecast for your street in five days' time or in some, some applications, you know, 20 days' time, it isn't going to be very good. Um, unfortunately, because we're in the UK and because the UK Met Office is the UK weather for, uh, forecast agency, we tend to get the rap for that, even though it's probably nothing to do with us. So uh, my only advice there will be look for the Met Office logo, and if you don't see it, don't believe it. But I, you know. <coughs> um, so in order, to, in, in order to apply those mathematics, we need something to hang the maths off. And the thing we use to hang the maths off is, is called a dynamical core. So going back to the kind of computational side of it, inside the supercomputer, conceptually, uh, the reason that the Met Office needs such a high density of highly parallelized compute is because the job that we're trying to solve is mathematically uh, parallel. It's intrinsically parallel. It's not a problem that you can federate easily. It's not a problem that you can break down into bits and distribute widely and then reassemble into, to provide information. It doesn't have that characteristic. I'm not going to go into why, partly because we haven't got enough time, partly because my maths isn't up to it. Um, so I rely on others to tell me that's true. Um, so, uh, so essentially the concept is relatively straightforward. If you think about it inside the model, you have a steady state of now at a place and a time and you're trying to predict at, other pl at lots of places and, and, and sequentially out in time how that situation is going to evolve. So to some extent, every node of calculation needs to know the preceding result of the, of the sum of the adjacent nodes, if that makes sense. So you can't possibly imagine, go back to your lecture theatre, your globe, your Fry Richardson amphitheatre, every person needs to be passed a calculation from the person next to them in order to progress their calculation. So computationally, that means that you need a highly parallel, parallel dense computer state to be able to run the job. So people often ask the question, why have you got a supercomputer? Why don't you run the problem in the cloud? You can run the problem in the cloud. That has been done. It's been shown to run. It's a very inefficient way to do things, but it can be done. Uh, it, can, it typically takes a very long time to get a result, and it costs an awful lot of money whilst you do it. Some of the problems are yet to be, uh, yet to be achieved in the cloud notably this 4D VAR assimilation. So um, there are some real practical, um, practical reasons why that's hard. So right now, the Met Office runs three operational domains. So we run a global domain, and I think, somebody can correct me if they're here and I get it wrong, I think it's at 14 kilometers right now, is that right? 17 or 14? 17. So it's 17 kilometers right now. So what that means is, if you imagine a chick set of chicken wire laid across the globe, uh, then grid squares are 17 kilometers big, uh, and it goes out into the atmosphere in a non-linear way. That's an atmospheric thing, so there's more layers at, towards where we live, uh, at the lower end of the atmosphere than there are in the, in the stratosphere, in the highest, higher level of the atmosphere, um, and it goes up in 70 levels. So um, that gives you, if you do the math, something approaching a billion 
points of calculation. So, um, so every time you crank this handle on the supercomputer, you've got a billion places you've got to do that calculation for every time step that you're going to do it. And some of these processes are calculated on very short time steps, seconds, some are hours, and, 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 and some are longer. Um, so inside the model, that's going on all the time. At a global scale, there's then a, a, a regional scale model, which is at four kilometers. And there's a, a, a mesoscale model, a high resolution model that runs over the UK, currently one and a half kilometers in operations. Uh, and there's a 300 meter test model that's run in some parts of the UK. All of them approximately, when you do the maths, you end up with about a billion points of calculation. So computationally, they're pretty much all as expensive as the other. Um, there's, not, there's not a heck of a difference. Now, I've restricted this talk to numerical weather prediction, i.e. weather forecasts. Uh, the Met Office operate at all temporal scales. That means climate research and, and those kinds of things. Some of these models are unbelievably computationally expensive. So they run for months. Um, and they take billions and billions and billions of computer cycles to complete. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on, a, uh, on why in a second. Um, so going back to Louis Fry Richardson, um, now that we've uh, kind of explained that, then um, he did a six hour forecast which took six weeks to calculate. It was published six years after he did it in 1922, and it was a 200 kilometer four by four grid of four levels in the atmosphere. So that was the kind of scale of it. Uh, the date of, for the forecast was 20th of May 1910, and it was entirely wrong. Um, but what it did do is that it proved the principle. It proved that in theory, given understanding the mathematical, uh, uh, typically fluid dynamics, mass of the atmosphere, and given uh, uh, an observation or a start state, in theory, you could turn this handle computationally and you could predict the future. So it was quite a seminal part. That was actually Louis Fry Richardson's computer. That was his, uh, that was his desktop calculator on which he performed those calculations. So uh, starting to move into the modern age, uh, again, start of 10, anybody recognize that machine? That's the bomb, so that's Bletchley Park bomb. Um, uh, or, the, or at least the rebuilt, re, rebuilt version of it. Uh, it's got no significance other than being an early supercomputer. Um, taking us into the kind of modern age, this chap's called John von Neumann. He was an American, Hungarian, um, naturalized American. Uh, and in 1946 was one of the team that justified the first real computer, ENIAC-1. And ENIAC-1 was set off, and this guy decided what grand challenges could be solved with the, uh, in the modern world of, of computers. And there were four grand challenges, and I have to admit I only know three, and if anybody knows the fourth, I'll be really impressed. So um, one was weather forecasting, one was ballistics, which ultimately turned into astrophysics, which is still you know, clearly a, a big user of highly parallel supercomputer, uh, and, the, and the other was quantum physics, uh, and obviously that was around the atom bomb. Um, the fourth one, nobody ever knows. I, I asked, does anybody know what the fourth one was? I've not been able to find it for a long time, and neither has anybody else. So if you ever do, let me know. But apparently there were four grand challenges, and I only know what three of them were. Um, but certainly one of them, one of them was weather forecasts. Um, and so that is ENIAC-1. Um, and one of the first things that it did was a 24-hour uh, weather forecast, which it did in 24 hours. So the miraculous thing here was that technology by 1950 was good enough to actually have a, a reasonable, reasonably useful weather forecast but unfortunately, it took as long to run as the weather took to evolve, which wasn't you know, entirely, entirely helpful. Um, but it was where the principles uh, were, were evolved. Um, let see if there's anything in there. No, that's OK. Yeah. And that's what it produced. So uh, this 24-hour forecast in 24 hours, it only had one level, so it didn't go up in the atmosphere. It only calculated surface pressures. Um, it's, it's well documented. Um, so anyway, that's what it looked like. So. Our problem, our, our problem, or our curse, or our, or our, or our technological challenge uh, and opportunity is Moore's Law. And I'm not going to uh, insult your intelligence by describing Moore's Law. Suffice to say that there is a fantastic uh, way to describe Moore's Law, particularly to, to non-technical people, which I discovered recently, which is an epic poem written by the Persian poet Ferdowsi, and it's called Shaname. And it was written between 977 and 1010 CE. And it's an apocryphal tale about a deal, I'm not going to go into too many details, but a deal that was done, which essentially a guy got a guy to sign a contract to say, well, if, if I'll, 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 I'll do this thing uh, if you put one grain of sand on, on, on a chessboard on square one and then double it for every square. And obviously the implication is that that's a power curve. That's an exponential relationship, as is Moore's Law, which 
notionally, the doubling of the amount of silicon on the silicon chip every 18 months. Now, whilst Moore, Moore's law itself doesn't drive us, that drives the whole of technology, which in turn drives us. So it, it, this power curve illustrates, um, illustrates uh, a, a, a thing. And an important thing about a power curve is that the plateau, the kind of, um, the kind of uh, uh, um, foothills, are fairly modest. So doubling small numbers not a big deal really. Uh, but the interesting thing that comes out of this uh, apocryphal tale is, is that um, if you think of it in chessboard terms, then the second half of the chessboard contains four billion times as many grains as the first half of the chessboard. So it gives you an idea of just how impactful power curves get as you get into them. And, and of course, as, a, as one of the four grand challenges for compute and the Met Office being in that industry and always being on the cusp of Moore's Law, very much at the forefront of technology, a number of times we've kind of hit big paradigm changing glass ceilings, if you like. They've forced a completely different take on how we perform our mission. And we're interestingly just about to enter one. So there's one coming up now, which is the transition into Exascale, which has all kinds of challenges associated with it. And, and Met Office is banging the first organization in our domain to be banging very, very firmly on that door right now. So um, second half of the chessboard. Um, more formally, and a, a, proof, a proof, if you like, that we are on Moore's Law, uh, and I forget which way around this is, I think the red line, yeah, the red line is Moore's Law. And the green line is the computational capacity of the history of Met Office supercomputers up to date with the very latest Cray XC40 that we're putting into place now. And what you'll see is that Met Office computational capacity very slightly outstrips Moore's law. And clearly that's a logarithmic scale on the left-hand side. So in, in reality, that is a, that is a power curve. Um, so you can see that it's true. <laughs> we do keep up with Moore's law. And Moore's law does drive our computational capacity and hence our, hence our, hence our complexity. So, it wasn't that long ago when, you know, none of this really made a big difference. And, and you know, going back to sort of the 1980s, um, the computational capacity of a supercomputer was very, very, very spookily similar, actually, to an iPad Air 2. Um, so your iPad Air 2, and we've done the sums, could probably run the numerical weather prediction models, if somebody could bother to port them, uh, of something circa 1988, 1982. So, you know, not a big deal in, in its own right. Uh, however, since then, this second half of the checkerboard, this second half of the chessboard, has started to really bite in. And the changes that have driven in, in a time that seems like yesterday to me, you know, 1987 was, was reel to reel tapes, it was coloured jumpers and Michael Fish, you know, it doesn't, in my mind, that's just yesterday. Um, down in the bottom right hand corner, by the way, there's a young computer engineer called Chris Little. I'm going to come back to him in a minute, but one of our guys. Um, so not that long ago, not that long ago, that was, you know, that was how it was. And really, Moore's Law hadn't bitten by them. We're in the first half of the chessboard. Doubling every year on a low number, yeah, it doesn't really make an odds. And, and, and to all of us, actually, that world has changed really quickly, really quickly. I've been here for nine years. And in that nine years, I've really seen this bite from, a, from uh, the, the, the generation of supercomputers that was here nine years ago when I arrived versus the challenges that I'm looking forward to over the next decade. So that's a 20-year span. Unbelievable change. Down the bottom right-hand side of the corner there and the purpose of the diagram. Well, that's still Chris Little. He still works here. Um, what that says, really, and, and I've put Chris in there because he represents a whole cohort of people here at the office. They've really grown up with this stuff from the days of ENIAC, almost. Um, some of them, particularly people like uh, uh, Dave Professor Julius Lingo, I hope she's not here. Um, but some of, some of our more senior scientists and mathematicians really were around in those days, really were working on those problems alongside Louis Fry Richardson and those kind of, those kind of people. And they're still here working on the cutting edge of technology. So we've got people here on, in technology terms that really get things from first principles, which is fantastic, um, absolutely fantastic. So a lot of the things that we do and have done for a long time, big data, Internet of Things, they're all great words to describe uh, other people catching up with the capabilities and the possibilities to do the things that we've been doing for quite some time. It doesn't mean to say we know everything. It means to say that we've got a very deep understanding in a very narrow use case. Um, but it does mean that we've got some relevance, more relevance probably in the outside world than, than, than we've perhaps hitherto done. So into the contemporary world and talking a little bit about where we are, um, why does the metal fix exist? And there are some fancy words up there that can be resolved in a more succinct way, which is to protect life property, to enhance well-being, and to support economic growth. So the fundamental Met Office mission, that's what it's all about. Um, and, and, and that's what we, uh, what we aspire to do. So what makes us different? I've already kind of covered this a little bit. Met Office is not quite unique, but certainly unique in, in the top tier, in so much that we cover all temporal and geospatial scales. So 
if you go to the States, for example, there are seven or eight or nine organizations that do what the Met Office does, because um, so, they break up weather at different temporal spans and different geographies into different organizations, and, and that's the way they do things. So um, that has huge advantages for you as a taxpayer and I as a taxpayer, in so much that we are uber efficient. We are super efficient. Um, I'm going to qualify how, how we're super efficient I I I in a minute. But there are significant scientific and engineering advantages to doing all this in one house, um, and we are a, an efficient little ship. So we've kind of covered this already. How, you know, what's the recipe, if you like, for weather forecasting? It's a mixture of the observations with the knowledge that comes from a big science program put into an operational set of operational model suites, suites to allow us to produce these 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 weather forecasts. So. Putting a technology overlay onto this, another model that we use quite a lot to describe who we are is this bow tie. Uh, and what, what that tries to say is that, is that on the one hand, on the far left hand side, Met Office is a quite a deep science organisation. To qualify that, um, in terms of international geo institutes, there are 43,000 I believe. Um, and the Times Higher Educational Supplement did a survey in 2010 based on citations, which is a common measure of their worth. And in that measurement, the Met Office was number one in the world. Um, so more citations to the Met Office than any other geo institute in the world. Uh, and that's, that's a heck of a thing. And that qualifies just how, how, how serious, if you like, we are in global terms as a research institute. However, increasingly, actually, we don't do that alone. So I think uh, it's, it's quite a rare thing these days for a set of Met Office people to write and publish a paper. Almost always now that's done in collaboration with another research partner, be that somebody in the international community or, or, or academia. So yes, we do have one or two of the world's leading experts in the, in, in the organization, but increasingly that's done in collaboration. The Met Office is playing a really strong leadership role um, in structured and unstructured academic, uh, uh, academic um, um, collaboration. So a good one to point out is something called MOAP, the Met Office Academic Partnership, which I'm going to get this wrong, but I believe that's um, Exeter, Cambridge, I think Oxford now, uh, Leeds, uh, and the Met Office. And I've probably forgotten a few, but I think that's about it. And to some extent, those researching universities forsake some of their kind of halcyon principles, so their free blue sky research, to work in a more structured and thematic way so that the sum of that research is much more than the sum of the parts. Um, and that's quite a rare thing. Um, for those of you that are academics or have worked in academia, you'll know that, to be honest, um, often uh, academic research is a, uh, I'm trying to think of a polite way because it's on the camera to say um, it's a competition where trendy, researchable, fundable themes, all the, all the universities will chase after those fundable themes. So it's quite unusual that you find uh, those kinds of calibre of research institutes working in a much more structured and collaborative fashion towards a common goal. Um, but certainly it happens in this area. Uh, in the middle, we kind of have a hub, which is there, that's 24 by 7 by 365, a real operational core. Very, very unusual for anybody that's involved in, in research. So our ability to operationalize that research in terms of, uh, of high availability weather forecast is very unusual. And on the right-hand side, all of that is, is not much use unless you do something with it. So there's a, there's a, there's a need to distribute that information. Uh, and, again, and again, we certainly don't do that our own. Increasingly, we do that with the private sector, as some of you may have read recently in the press. Um, but I'll move quickly on. Um, if, if I'm to overlay that with a kind of, and it is a, a necessarily simplistic kind of overview of, of the role that technology plays, you can broadly break our technology into three lumps, if you like. So on the left-hand side, to support that science mission, we've obviously got the supercomputer. We've uh, associated with the supercomputer as it can manage in, it creates a lot of data. So we've got uh, almost unbelievably large uh, um, uh, data storage systems. And... Uh, uh, SPICE represents a program of activity underway to give our research scientists the optimal research environment. So how do scientists collaborate effectively with other scientists in other domains? SPICE is our, is our answer. Essentially, that's very high power, a high power computer state as well, um, uh, uh, and, and connectivity to other research institutions. Um, to give you an idea of scale, I, I think I might, I might come on to this later, but if I do, I'll, I won't mention it. To give you an idea of scale of all that today, the HPC that we have today is an IBM Power 7. It's actually three IBM Power sevens with a sum total computational capacity of something approaching 1.2 petaflops. Uh, our onboard storage capacity, uh, sorry for those of you that are into these things, petaflops are, are 10 times 10 to the 15 floating operations per second. 
a lot. That's a big machine. By anybody's standards, even by today's standards, that's a big machine. Um, and we have about 60 petabytes of uh, storage capacity. Um, now, because of resilience, that's not unique data, but that's kind of the scale of it, it's kind of the scale of it today. Um, that's before we go on to talk at all about, uh, about where we're going, uh, courtesy of, of the latest bid. Um, so in the middle, what does that kind of technology look like? Well, for any of you that worked in uh, enterprise IT anywhere, it looks just like that, frankly. I've come out of the retail and distribution industry, and it looks just like you're gonna find it at a large retail bank or a large, uh, a large retailer. It's you know typical, traditional uh, um, uh, relational databases, mainframes, large-scale Linux, uh, uh, commodity, commodity tin, uh, or virtual, virtual technologies, it's that kind of stuff. Um, uh, so, so that's all you know, fairly generic, but is highly available. And on the right-hand side, as you can imagine, loads of distribution technologies in terms of apps, um, websites of one sort and another, uh, sophisticated, rich internet applications, websites, uh, but increasingly APIs. So uh, a key part of where we're going, of course, is this kind of new machine-to-machine -machine expert system world, whereby people don't want visualized applications so much as they want a, a data feed um, to feed into their, to their applications. Um, yeah, we talked about that. So all this computational affordability, or all this com computational capacity, where do we spend it? So the first one, which we've already talked a little bit about, is in terms of resolution. So uh, the nice analogy here is a digital camera. Everybody's familiar with that paradigm these days. So we've all had a crappy digital camera that you take a picture of and you, you zoom in with Photoshop or whatever, and before you know it, it pixelates into something that's unusable. Um, in a, in a very close analogy, the same is true about the resolution of a weather forecast. Essentially, the more pixels you have in it, the more grid squares you hit, the finer scale you can do, that, you can manage the, the more information that you can generate and you can, you can work with. So resolution is a very important part. Um, but interesting, there are a couple of golden laws there. So um, I've talked about we're at uh, um, 17 to go to 14 kilometers at a global scale, and we're at one and a half kilometers at a mesoscale. The reason why they're both good numbers is that 14 kilometers is a great, a great scale of resolution uh, for synoptic weather. So it's, it's great at capturing and modeling synoptic weather. So synoptic weather are fronts that are moving around, uh, and you see it all the time on the telly, all your isobar fronts. It's a good resolution to capture and track and predict those kinds. And you've got to go quite a long way, actually, as luck would have it, down to one and a half kilometers to begin to cope with heat weather, uh, so convective weather. So convective weather is a little different from synoptic weather in so much that it's driven by hot air rising and moisture and all that kind of stuff. So this is your, your spontaneous thunderstorm type stuff. Um, so uh, a typical storm front will be about four kilometers, convective storm, storm uh, um, scenario will be about four kilometers, and you need apparently a few pixels of information to be able to describe and track that. Uh, track that. So we're at kind of two golden numbers already, really. So um, there's not a heck of a lot of reason to drive resolution down in either of those domains in, 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 in production terms right now. So there are important other ways in which we can spend this computational capacity. So first one is observations. We can never have enough observations. Uh, a key limitation to our ability to predict the future is our ability to articulate the present. Um, so the better that we can do that, the more that we can assimilate more information, and there's more and more of it out there. So a good example is, is what others refer to as the Internet of Things. So the Met Office uh, rely on a highly structured and calibrated observation network that's largely been there for a long time. However, there's every possibility of augmenting that calibrated network with other observations, massive observations from other sources. So we all carry things like mobile phones and things. Uh, not a lot of use on our own, but it, they can certainly add value. At the moment, the expense of doing it far outweighs the benefit of doing it, but that, the, that equation will change over time. Um, so observations and the assimilation of them. The next is complexity. So this is easier to describe when you talk about uh, uh, the, the more extended uh, temporal timescales. Um, so obviously, uh, if you're talking about the climate, then you can't just really talk about the weather because we all know things like anthropogenic effects uh, and the fact that release of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, greenhouse gas effect, and all that kind of stuff. So you, you get to the point where you can't model enough, really, because you're trying to model what the scientists refer to as a full Earth system, ultimately, uh, in order to accurate, really accurately predict what's going to happen in future state climate. So every time you couple in, even in weather terms, uh, we, we're already just about to couple in. Uh, in fact, I think we may have already coupled in. I'm looking, I think, in the, in the medium range, we're already couple in uh, sea surface, 
that's right, isn't it, for GLOSI 5? Yeah, that's fairly recent. Um, so we couple in the, uh, state, the surface of the, um, surface, uh, of, the uh, of the oceans into the weather models right now, and obviously we go into the depths of the oceans for the climate models. So there's an example of just more information that has to be coupled in a model, and all of that uh, is computationally expensive. Um, and then finally is a concept, a new concept. So um, the new concept is that to date, I've only talked about prediction and simulation as a one-shot process, i.e. you feed in the observations, you crank the handle, the supercomputer outcomes of weather forecast. In reality, um, we don't do that. Uh, so increasingly what we do do is recognising the uh, uh, statistical weaknesses of a few things. So firstly, the observations. We know the observation, the state of the observations are imperfect. And we can describe mathematically how imperfect they are. So we can therefore mathematically say, well, although we think it's a 10, it could be a 9 or it could be an 11. So by perturbating uh, the, 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 the inputs, if you like, around known errors, then you put, put that into the forecast, wind the handle on the forecast, and sometimes it will say a different thing. So that's known, for those of you that are mathematicians, that's very similar to a kind of Monte Carlo approach. Uh, we call it ensemble prediction systems. So you run the model a number of times, or EPSs, and again, that's described on our website. So instead of running a model once, you actually perturbate about around your known assumptions, and you run the model a number of times, and you have different outcomes. And if those outcomes say very, very different things, then you have low confidence in any of them telling you the truth. Um, if they all say broadly the same thing, then you've got high confidence in any of them telling you the truth. But, so what that gives you are two factors, and, and I've always found this difficult to get my head around, but I'm sure it's true. So it gives you a, an idea of probability and confidence, and they're two different measures. So you get a probability number, percentage of this or that, uh, as a probability distribution function, for, again, mathematicians, actually, um, but you also get a confidence in that prediction, which is a slightly different uh, way to look at the numbers. And so... Um, when I talk about UK weather forecast, uh, we, the current operational model is the UKV, is that right? Yeah. And the, and the ensemble version of that is the MoGreps UK. MoGreps UK has 12 members, we're around one and a half kilometres, we run that a number of times a day, and each time that falls off the supercomputer, it falls off at about 400 gigabytes. So that's an example of the, of the volume associated with a single set of weather forecasts for a single operational domain. So that'll be run a number of times a day. Uh, in the future, that'll be run at, at, at probably every hour, and probably with many more members. So uh, Richard Lawrence sat there at the back of the room, he's one of our chief architects who's working on uh, overcoming some of the challenges of this Moore's law driven, far end of the chessboard, oh my word, what does our architecture look like to support these almost unimaginable numbers? And it's less about the supercomputer, because we're very confident about that, it's more about what you do with the stuff as it comes off the supercomputer is actually more of a challenge, uh, and, and squeezing as much information out of that in a, in a costly and efficient way, uh, it's the, the more of the challenges sit there than they do actually running the models in the first place. Um, yeah. So, all of that has caused uh, us to have a rethink. I talked about paradigm changes driven by Moore's Law. So, a big paradigm change is, well, let's have a sit back and let's think about what we're actually doing. So, we use this model quite a lot to remind ourselves what we do. Um, so, hopefully, you'll recognize this as the story to date um, in information terms. So, we have a bunch of scientists who are very clever people who have postulations, ideas about how the atmosphere may work. Um, that's their job. That's what they get paid for. And their job is to, through the peer review process, through the normal workings of science, to establish a body of accepted scientific knowledge proving their postulations and the hypotheses. They embed that knowledge as information in our unified model. Our unified model, just to remind you, are the codes that run on the supercomputer. And that produces an awful lot of data. Now, so far, that's interesting, um, but actually doesn't solve anybody's problems at all. All that does is a very, sci very interesting scientific experiment. And if the Met Office is guilty of anything, it's probably confusing uh, that as being enough, um, because it isn't. Because in reality, increasingly, those data that are produced as part of the modelling process really aren't any good to anybody, actually, uh, unless you happen to be uh, a, a physicist uh, or an atmospheric scientist. So that, those data need to be converted into data that are actually useful and usable by other people, such that we can turn, they can turn them back into some information, such that they can establish some knowledge that they hitherto haven't had, such that they can make good decisions. So going back to our mission statement, protecting life, property, and all that kind of stuff, that's actually what we're trying to do in information terms. So that's 
we actually don't do that once. There's a, there's a, there's a, um, um, don't know what the right word is, but there's a, there's a, I'm sure it's not real, but it kind of sounds about right number, um, which is 4 million. So the, uh, the, 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 the number that bounces around the Met Office is we produce about 4 million forecasts a day. I've no idea if that's true, but it sounds about right to me. Um, wouldn't be at all surprised. Um, and what that means is that we are, um, uh, and those circles articulate the kind of markets that we work in. So you've got the kind of climate work, military and defense, aviation, marine, moving, moving uh, boys around and stuff. I'm not sure what that bottom one is. It looks like a pilot again. Uh, and renewables. So they're all areas. Oh, it might be a, might be a power station, perhaps. Um, but anyway, they're, they're all markets for whom those kind of process data sets look quite different from the input data sets or the output data sets of the, of the supercomputer. There's a lot of work required to make useful data sets that are any use to anybody. And I know, again, living in this open data world that we're all brought into, everybody assumes that data, data equals information and that there's plenty of armchair analysts out there that would quite happily use the raw data. You will not use the raw data. Um, that's not a, not a boastful statement. That's if you don't happen to have a supercomputer and you don't happen to be a physicist of some really significant worth, you will not be using that raw data. And we're quite protective about this because actually the dangers of using those data inappropriately are fairly high, actually. They're fairly high. So there's quite a big custodian process. So I work very closely with the Open Data Institute because obviously morally and ethically and because we're paid for by the public, everything we do needs to be open. But at the same time, we've got to be quite careful that misguided, mi um, ill-educated, people just don't make mistakes, basically. Uh, it's very easy to dip into these massive data sets and pull out entirely inappropriate conclusions if you're not aware of the weaknesses. And you won't be aware of the weaknesses unless you happen to be an atmospheric physicist. So, um, so there's kind of quite a lot of work to do for these data to be useful. But nonetheless, increasingly, they are the product. So it wasn't that long ago uh, where the world consisted of us creating websites and apps and so on, but increasingly, the new services are the data themselves. Um, and, yeah, that's what that means. So an interesting example is an expert system uh, being developed by a partner of ours. So you may be aware that aeroplanes maintain a what's known as a safe horizontal, dist uh, safe horizontal separation. That's almost an arbitrary number that's pulled out of the air, whereby it's been agreed by ICAO and the, the relevant authorities that that is a safe distance for airplanes to find apart. Now, on further research, it's been found that sometimes it isn't. Uh, I can be quite specific, actually. It's the diurnal effects of being near, or of being anywhere near hot sand and relatively cold water. And um, airports, and there are a few of these, one of them happens to be a very big one and is, is struggling with capacity, um, in those effects sometimes that seemingly safe separation distance isn't actually safe. So the, uh, the, the uh, vortex, the vortices created by big aeroplanes can actually impact, negatively impact aeroplanes that are at the safe separation distance. But that's really rare. More commonly, and throughout the world, that's actually a ridiculously overly safe, um, overly safe distance. And what it means is that uh, people like Heathrow, for example, want to build a second runway. And one of the reasons for that is the capacity to get enough airplanes hitting the ground. So what these people are doing are some very, very clever high-end maths that takes some of these big data sets and uses a knowledge of the physics and chemistry involved with the, the generation of vertices to dynamically create safe separation distances. So literally an airplane would be guided in at a time where it's dynamically calculated to be safe based on a, a, an understanding of, of the condition of the atmosphere. Now this stuff is really, really clever. Um, so both safer and more capacity. Just a, and you can imagine, I don't need to go through the maths to describe just how commercially advantageous that is. If you don't have to build another runway, hey, that's, 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 that's pretty impressive. Um, so uh, I talked about kind of we're an end-to-end -end organization. So uh, uh, to be honest, anybody can do the data things. And I don't want to get too carried away by that. Um, the Met Office still employ a large number of operational meteorologists. I go back, there's a great statement, one of you, People may know who said it, but I don't. Um, the, which is, which is, all models are wrong, but some models are useful, and that's absolutely true, right? All models are wrong, but some models are useful. They're an approximation of the real world, so by definition, they can't be true. Um, and, and indeed, treating predictive models as deterministic right and wrong is a really bad, bad, bad place to go. Um, so, an important role that the operational meteorologists play wasn't that long ago. Again, when I arrived nine years ago, they were almost well. They were very often probably more often than not, an intrinsic part of the generation process. So they used to look at this raw data and they, from that, would generate a weather forecast from which products and services were created. Increasingly, in a mere nine years, they don't do that anymore. No, that's not, that's, that's, a, that's a, 
a generic statement, and it's not true in some areas, but increasingly, weather forecasts and the use of them are data to data, data to system, fully integrated technology products. So, of course, we've already established the models are wrong. Sometimes we know why the models are wrong, we know when they're wrong. So, this other stream, if you like, of added value is that deep, deep knowledge, right back to the science base, right through to the application of being able to say to people like military, uh, military pilots, don't take off today, or yes, take off now, but don't take off in an hour. So it's that ability to, regardless of what the numbers say, to be able to provide a narrative over the top of it. And that's a key part of what the Met Office offers, um, which, which not, not everybody does. That's a shame. I see this working. So um, to give you an idea of what these things look like, this is a visualized, visualized version of a deterministic model running at a mesoscale. This happens to be, uh, it's not... It's done just as good a job much more recently than that's the last time that anybody's bothered to put two things side by side and, and geo and temporarily locate them. Um, but on the, I always get this wrong, on the right hand side is observations, yeah it must be. So that's indicated by the fact they're circular, so that's the radar. And on the left hand side is, and this happens to be, I is this the St. Jude's thing or is that, I don't know, is a, a big flood event anyway. Uh, on the left hand side is what the model was saying three hours, I think it was, three hours prior to the action, uh, three days prior to the actual event. So what this is showing you is a kind of synoptic scale. So again, if you, if, you, if you don't understand the weaknesses of the data and you zoom into your postcode, then you could well, you could well infer that it isn't going to rain in your street and it's going to rain two streets up there. You just can't do that kind of thing. You have to step back from the data to the appropriate degree. But you can see how well and how compelling these models are. I mean, that, that's the other problem, is they are visually so compelling, it's very easy to think, well, that must be true then, because it's visually compelling. Um, but you can see what a great job that's done of capturing that particular, that particular front coming through. And that's not at all atypical, as I've said. I've not pulled out one. I must refresh it, actually. 2012, it makes it look as if that's the last time it happened. Um, oh, yeah, so St. Jude, uh, five days ahead, the models were picking out with some specificality the St. Jude's model. But um, working with the media people, um, BBC stated there, you will see increasingly on the TV they're, 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 they're beginning to buy into this whole notion of probability and confidence. And they're beginning to say, well, we think the track's going to be here, but it could be here, it could be here. There's one going on right now with the remnants of this hurricane. Some of you mentioned the name, and I can't remember what it was. Um, that, that apparently is going to dip, dip south or go north in the UK right now. But, but there's some uncertainty as to which way it will go. Um, so that's a, a a good example of using these kind of um, ensemble based techniques. Um, so finally, and to finish off, I'm just going to take get you up to speed with where we are with the, the latest supercomputer. I apologize for stumbling through this, by the way, but I've got a colleague that was going to go through this and he decided to go sick this morning, so he didn't turn up. Um, <laughs> so this particular part. Um, so you may have heard in the, or seen in the press recently that the Met Office were awarded uh, 97 million pounds of your and mine hard-earned taxpayer cash to put in what will be one of the world's largest HPC facilities, and that's, that's undergoing right now. So uh, just a few facts and figures really about that. So um, the Met Office back in 2010, 2011, uh, created a socio-economic business case to justify that investment. Uh, predates all of this and that went to the science and technology select committee in 2012 uh, and was verified by people like treasury and cabinet office and so on uh, such that in november 2012 um, it was uh, it was approved as a business case which is called unlocking potential um, yeah yeah so um Notionally, the Chancellor at that point, or the, yeah, the Chancellor said, uh, yes, you can, you can have this £97 million based on, uh, and we just don't have time to go into it, nor is it particularly compelling, what turned out to be a 14 to 1 gearing between pounds invested versus socio-economic benefit realised in quite a hard quite a hard-nosed um, business case. Uh, it's not yet published, but it will be imminently. We're, we're currently still working through some of the commercials, but there will be a sub, sub, uh, uh, a, an abridged version of that published fairly shortly, and it's, it's worth a read. It's very, it's, in terms of socio-economic business cases, we all know them. Uh, it's, quite, it's quite a decent one. So competitive dialogue with vendors started in spring to summer of 2014. Um, yeah, there's some stuff about approval in here. Essentially, Cray were contracted as the HPC supplier in, on October the 14th. And the reason why that's a... Um, yeah, it's all lovely. So we've talked a bit about this. Uh, this is the one I want to get. Yeah, so some numbers that you can hang by. This is quite relevant. Um, essentially, that socioeconomic business case projected an additional £2 billion pounds worth of, of benefit to the UK based on the investment of £97 million. Pounds. Um, and... Yeah, here we go. 
So the full business case was approved in October 14. September, of 15, September 15, phase 1A went operational. That was about three weeks ago. And we're extremely proud of that. So what that essentially says is that we had five months between knowing, agreeing and signing on the dotted line with Cray and then getting an operational supercomputer with brand new cutting edge technology in and running downstairs. And it's taken over two weeks ago, three weeks ago, uh, two or three weeks ago as an operational machine. So we're in the process of decommissioning the own machines. For those of you that aren't to this, this is unbelievable really as, a, as, a, as an IT program. Uh, very, very large scale IT project. Uh, to get, typically, I won't name names, but we're not the only ones in the UK that operate a, an HPC, and you look at 18 months to two years to go from contract signing to commissioning an HPC. And the fact that we've man managed to do it in five months, you can imagine you pay to be on this cutting edge of Moore's Law. The fact that we can get an, a, a machine operational in, in five months is a huge um, 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 uh, calculable, and I do intend to calculate, calculate it, saving for the UK taxpayer because we paid a premium for that latest technology and we're exploiting that, 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 that technology very quickly. So uh, very proud of that particular mile, milestone. Um, in March 2016, Phase 1AB goes operational. Just to let you know, we have two IT halls here. Uh, phase 1A and Phase 1B uh, refer to uh, various stages of implementation within our two IT halls. Uh, and the next big one, um, not that Phase 1B isn't, isn't sophisticated, um, uh, basically, for the difference between 1A and 1B is simply around capacity and processor technology. So we're going from Haswell to Broadwell in phase 1A, 1B. I don't know if any of you are into your Intel, uh, into your Intel technologies. Uh, and then we're going to Skylake for, for phase 3. In all three, or certainly in phase 1AB and phase 3, will be amongst the handful of first users of those technologies. So we'll be operational on, Broad, on Haswell and Skylake pretty much before anybody else. Um, so we've managed to secure that silicon well before you'll get a chance to put it into your, into your PC. Um, and then phase, phase 1C, which will give us, uh, sorry, so uh, May 16th, IT Hall 3. So at the moment we have two IT halls here. We're in the process, and some of you may have noticed the building work, building a new IT hall over on Science Park. That will ultimately uh, house 70% of, of our new computational capacity. Brand new build, brand new IT hall. And that's what it looks like. So on the left-hand side, obviously that's the IT hall. On the right-hand side, that kind of uh, attractively, I'll say, <laughs> shaped building, which is really just a square with the corners knocked off. Um, there's a budget involved here. Um, is a collaboration centre. So a big feature of the new IT hall is that this place, as you've already discovered, is pretty tricky to get into. Even to get into the IT hall, even to get into the conference facilities, we need your name and where you're from and British National and all that kind of stuff. Uh, to actually get down into the, uh, to work anywhere near the data or the computers, you can imagine it's a pretty, it's a pretty stringent process. So one of the key features of, uh, of the new IT hall, and as described earlier on in the bow tie, is our need to collaborate in science and big data. So this is a more open facility and it's where most of the research will get done. So what it will allow us to do is to be more efficient and more effective in our collaborations with the wider academic community in developing those, those and exploiting those kinds of models. That's, that's one of the whole points. Um, so some, uh, some nice facts and figures, none of which I know. Apparently, uh, it weighs 140 tonnes, which is the same as 11 double-decker buses. Um, it has 48,000 cores, which is more than 100,000 PS4s. Uh, yeah, this is wrong, actually. Uh, oh, no, it's not. So, um, yeah, it's got 17 petabytes of attached spinning disk, um, which is enough to store 97 years uh, of HD movies. But more impressively, and it's not in here, I mentioned that our current computational capacity is about 1.2 petaflops, and this will take it to something exceeding, we think, 20 petaflops, something in that order. Uh, we're at 60 uh, petabytes of operational storage today. We have signed a contract with the new technology vendor that could potentially take us out to an exabyte by 2020. So we'll certainly, uh, we'll, that, that, um, so huge, uh, unimaginable almost uh, volumes of data. Um, but that does include uh, 17 petabytes of spinning disk. Um, what else have we got? Uh, yeah, so uh, there's a, uh, he's got the second half of a fact, but not the first half. By 2017, the theoretical peak speed of the machine will equate to more than 3 million calculations per second for all 7.8 billion people on the planet. And what he's missed out there is what it's like now, but it's something like, I can't remember, it just gives you a better idea of, of the increase of the, of the step change. But uh, yeah, some, some pretty impressive... Um, um, some pretty impressive statistics. So I mentioned earlier on, um, you know, will it stop? No, it won't. Um, 
unfortunately, Moore's law for me, unfortunately, I'm sure the scientists say fortunately, um, it's, it's relentless. Um, the, the, the experts say there's at least 10 years left in Moore's law for us, or at least Moore's law-like effects. So that's not to say that we're going to carry on doubling this, uh, the amount of silicon on the chip, but it does mean that Moore's law-like uh, increases in things like computational capacity and storage will, increase, will carry on for a, pretty much unhindered for at least another decade. This is a visualized version of, I uh, mentioned a 300-meter model, so this is looking at fog formation in valleys, 300-meter uh, resolution. Uh, it's kind of state-of-the-art uh, test stuff. Um, uh, ab absolutely fantastic, so uh, no limit to where it's going to stop. One of our, uh, one of our um, big issues is just sheer data volumes. So uh, our whole domain has relied on a kind of store and for paradigm. So the way that we distribute this stuff is typically to create a data file, stick it on an FTP server, and then lots of people dial in, or <laughs> they used to. Uh, lots of people will connect in via the internet and pull those data files down for reuse. We've already reached the point at which that's really not not, not practical for many of these big data files. So Richard and his colleagues are busily putting in a new layer of architecture which basically relies on dynamic subsetting. So the ability to say, well, from all that data I could have, I'm interested in this particular temporal, geospatial, or variable coverage. So in other words, I don't need it all. I just need, um, I need this particular part of the big data set. So it's still the raw data, but it's a subset of the raw data defined dynamically. So an example of use case would be an aeroplane flying through a four-dimensional trajectory. So obviously it's going to fly through space, and it's, as it flies through space, it's also flying through time. So you can describe that trajectory with maths in such a way you can pull out all the big data that describes that trajectory and just pass that over. So subsetting will take us a long way, and, and to a technical level, things like the Open Geospatial Consortium standards, uh, things like web processing service, uh, feature service, those kinds of standards allow us to use dynamic subsetting as a means through which we can transfer these data. Um, but even that, before very long runs out, even the subsets become too big to send to something like a UAV, um, which needs to know uh, how, it, how its environment affects it. So we're already working on the kinds of standards that take uh, computational standards really that take algorithms and allow us to put them in close proximity to the big data and run those algorithms against the big data and produce the results. So this is computational service. Uh, invoke services for those of you that are into, into European standards or web processing service if you're into your OGC standards uh, or at a, kind of, um, at, a, at a kind of conceptual level, the ability to describe a problem with an algorithm, transfer that algorithm to a place of computation, provide a computational service with that algorithm against some data and then give the, give, give the result back that's what you're kind of trying to do. Um, lots of vendors working in that kind of space because a, an important part when you start to offer those services crypt, is, is cryptographic um, 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 security. So clearly if you're a commercial organization wanting to run a piece of IP that you've developed, you don't really want our, our people or even our hypervisor to be able to see what's going on underneath it. So therefore that has to be cryptographically secure in such a way that to some extent even the machine doesn't know what it's done. All it, knows, all it, all it does is cryptographically perform the algorithm and provide the result back, which again is crypt cryptographically safe. So quite a, quite a lot of interesting, uh, interesting stuff going on there. I'm done. <laughs> I'm really done. <laughs> give, me, give me half a minute. I'm knackered for one thing. Um, finally, finally, um, I talked about paradigm changes. This is a, this is a, a plot. Um, the green line, the top line, if you like, shows the ideal, um, the ideal characteristic of the number of computational nodes versus running this physical model that we've got. So um, the black line at the bottom, uh, confusingly, new dynamics is the dynamical core structure that was put in place in 2006, about 2006, and you can see that it doesn't really scale beyond about 100 nodes. So you can't, it just won't, it won't, it won't scale, it starts to drop off, so you start throwing more nodes at it and you don't get any benefit in terms of computational capacity. Uh, end game, which is the amusingly titled even newer dynamics, um, <laughs> somebody ran out of ideas that day, uh, which is where we're at, at the moment, that, that's the kind of scaling characteristic. So um, this is, a, just to, to give you an idea, this is a decade-long science program to figure out how we can exploit latest architectures uh, as manifest today. But tomorrow the problem gets bad. Uh, I talked earlier on about the think of the world conceptually covered in a grid and the nodes of calculation are at that grid. You've got a kind of problem when you put a grid over a, over a sphere because you have effectively a singularity at the poles. 
um, and in the machine that expresses itself as an I.O. problem. You just can't get the numbers, I talked about getting the sums, the, the, the answers of the preceding sum to the adjacent nodes, you just can't get it in and out of that computational singularity. So uh, to cope with that right now we've moved the poles conveniently, so the poles aren't at the poles because we want to know what's going on at the poles, they're in places in the, in the middle of the ocean that we're not that bothered about, but that's a bit of a short term kludge. So there's another 10 year long science program that's been going called, uh, uh, called Gung Ho, and Gung Ho is all about looking for new mathematical structures upon which to hang the dynamical core calculations. Um, so, so it's so a, new, uh, a new core dynamic. And it's looking as if that kind of top right hand one, uh, or so, uh, so bottom, oh, I don't know which one it is now. Uh, think of a football, a soccer ball, soccer ball with pent uh, pe um, is it hexagons and pentagons, I think it is, isn't it? Yeah, he pe hexagon and pentagons, there is no singularity. Moreover, you could put, it's a bit fractal like in so much that you could put more pentagons and hexagons inside one pentagon or hexagon in order that you can scale dynamically. So, what that gives you is the ability to increase resolution infinitely, basically, without ever creating a singularity. Then you hang the maths off those kinds of structures and you don't create this. this output problem. So there are two projects and it's just to give you a flavour of the kinds of, and that's, that, this stuff's really hard, <laughs> um, it's really mathematically challenging uh, and it's one of the areas that we've got some active research in at the moment, it's to give you an idea of the, of, of the next problem that, uh, and this is the, the transition to exascale or those of you, uh, you know, transition to massively parallel uh, and by solving this problem we're solving the problem for others behind us. So there's other people still on the foothills of Moore's Law uh, that probably have a decade or more before they're going to have to think about this. And by the time they get there, as the Met Office has done many times before, hopefully we'll solve that problem. Um, so I think, I think that's it. Yeah, I'm not going to go there. I think I should stop right now. He can talk about all that kind of stuff. Um, so I am at that point, having, having gone uh, uh, up, to, up to time, I'll, I'll stop there. So thank you very much for your, uh, for your attention. And uh, if there's any questions, then I'll quite happily take them.